We're going to get started. I'm I'm led to believe, almost told that Mr. Waxman is on his way, and um, we're only doing opening statements uh, this afternoon. So the committee will come to order. The chair recognizes himself for an opening statement. Today we're going to mark up two important bipartisan energy bills as part of our open all of the above approach to protect jobs and keep energy affordable for all Americans. These bills, H.R. 3826, the Electricity Security and Affordability Act, and H.R. 2126, the Better Buildings Act, are positive steps toward a more sensible energy policy for the nation. Coal is our largest source of energy and a significant driver of jobs. It is both plentiful and affordable, and the energy produced from it is highly reliable. With coal as a foundation of our all-of-the-above strategy, we have a diverse and secure electricity portfolio that also includes natural gas, nuclear, and renewables. And with coal, we can continue providing homeowners and small businesses with reasonable electric bills and manufacturers with low energy costs that help them remain globally competitive. But EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards for new coal fire plant power plants do threaten the viability and reliability, re reliability of our entire system. EPA's harm is no longer speculative, as a number of coal-fired power plants have already shuttered or are scheduled to close in the near future. Their owners have attributed the shutdown, at least in part, to EPA's regs enacted over the last five years. Jobs have already been lost as a consequence of these anti-coal measures, and EPA's proposed rule would serve to accelerate the demise of coal. The agency's proposed new source Performance standards would surely be the nail in the coffin for any future coal-fired power plants requiring carbon capture and storage technologies that we know are not yet commercially available. The Electricity Security and Affordable Affordability Act is necessary to keep EPA, EPA accountable and to keep American energy affordable as well as reliable. It contains a number of eminently reasonable measures to ensure that coal remains a part of our future and I particularly want to thank our colleague Ed Whitfield as well as Senator Joe Manchin for their work on this bipartisan and bicameral bill. I would urge my colleagues to join me in standing up for jobs and passing this thoughtful legislation to restore balance to EPA's power plant regs. We're also going to consider H.R. 2126, the Better Buildings Act, a bipartisan bill authored by David McKinley and Peter Welch. This legislation takes a critical step for energy efficiency by facilitating greater cooperation between landlords and tenants to save energy in our nation's commercial buildings. It takes a market-driven, voluntary, best practices approach to align building owners and occupants to reduce energy usage. I would urge my colleagues, uh, for my, I commend my colleagues for their bipartisan efforts on this important legislation and, too, also urge its approval. The cold weather that we've experienced in recent weeks underscores just how important it is to have affordable energy for our homes and businesses. So I'd urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support both of these bills as part of a true all-of-the-above energy strategy. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for you and the ranking member for uh, bringing up this bill. Today we're here to discuss two topics of great importance, the energy efficiency and greenhouse gas regulation. I'm pleased to see that the two parties have once again demonstrated the ability to work together on furthering energy efficiency initiatives. H.R. 2126 represents strong bipartisan work that will ultimately reward all involved parties. According to the National Institute of Building Sciences, the federal government owns and or leases more than 3 billion square feet of space. That is more than double all projects covered under the U.S. Green Buildings Council LEED program. The government spends in excess of $7 billion on energy at federal facilities. To achieve significant cost savings beyond design and construction, we need to address existing facilities and provide leadership and flexibility. As the largest single energy consumer, it makes sense for the government to conduct new research, coordinate outreach to key stakeholders, and create a framework for tenants and landlords to develop new initiatives. The Energy Star program has been a great success, saving $230 billion in reducing greenhouse gases by 1.8 billion metric tons in the last decade alone. 
Energy Star shows us that cooperation between the government, commercial, and household sectors can work the benefit of the economy and the environment, so expanding the program makes sense. I look forward to more bipartisan efforts using this type of program as a blueprint. Unfortunately, H.R. 3826 is not a similar effort, but instead represents the very divergent views of our committee. On the topic of greenhouse gas regulations, my view is different in some ways from those of my Republican colleagues. I believe it when scientists tell us that, that man-made global warming is real. I think we can address green regulation of greenhouse gases in a responsible way that lays the foundation for a clean economy while protecting our vital industries. In other words, my views are very similar. I do not believe the EPA regulation of greenhouse gases is the right solution to our energy and climate challenges. I think we're both interested in improving the economy and creating jobs, but until Congress moves to pass meaningful legislation, uh, efforts such as H.R. 3826 are not the correct way to address the issue. It's important to remember there are more factors at play than just environmental regulation. Today, developments in technology allow us to look for towards a future of energy diversity and climate sustainability. Diversification of fuels provides opportunities for consumers, manufacturers, and producers. With respect to electricity in Texas, we're working to include both fossil fuels and renewables into the grid. We're number one wind producer in the country and the number one natural gas producer. These developments allow our economy to increase and our carbon footprint to decrease. The marketplace is very much at work. I believe that the market trends to continue to contribute significantly to the retirement of older power plants. But that said, the situation faces our power sector, specifically our fossil fuel powered plants, remains fluid. According to U.S. Energy Information Agency, coal is regaining some market share from natural gas. Additionally, fossil fuel fired plants will con constitute approximately one third of our electric power generation sector for decades to come. To create much needed certainty, Congress should develop a regulatory program that will promote economic growth and provide a responsible path forward. But until we sensibly work together to protect the economy and the environment, EPA will move forward under existing authority. I look forward to any opportunity to work together on these issues, and I yield back my time. Jim and Neil Beck, Chair, would recognize the Chair of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, Mr. Whitfield, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman Upton, and thanks for bringing these uh, two important bills uh, to the full committee for markup, which will begin tomorrow. I want to congratulate Mr. McKinley and Mr. Welch both for their Better Buildings Act of 2013 and uh, know that we'll adopt that legislation. I'm going to confine most of my remarks uh, to the uh, electric Security and Affordability Act. As many of you know, President uh, Obama has adopted an extreme position, in my view, and is pushing us down the road that Europe has followed as it relates to renewable energy and addressing climate change. Uh, in fact, his greenhouse gas regulation, which is expected to become final this summer, will make it impossible to build a new coal-powered plant in America because the emission standards that that regulation sets cannot be achieved by any commercially viable technology. I would also like to read from yesterday's New York Times uh, the headlines, Europe facing economic pain may ease climate rules. For years, Europe has tried to set the global standard for climate change regulation, creating tough rules on emissions mandating more use of renewable energy sources and sacrificing economic growth in the name of saving the planet. High energy costs, declining industrial competitiveness, and a recognition that the economy is unlikely to rebound strongly anytime soon are leading policymakers in Europe to begin easing up in their drive for more aggressive climate regulation. On Wednesday, the European Union proposed an end to binding national targets for renew renewable energy production after 2020. The legislation that we'll be voting upon tomorrow and debating tomorrow is a common sense approach. Basically, it sets limits that are achievable with existing technology adequately demonstrated. It does not mandate the building of uh, coal-powered plants. It only says and the uh, result will be in the future, if it's determined, say, natural gas prices are higher 
and someone wants to build a coal power plant in America as they do el everywhere else in the world, they will be able to do so using the best av available technology. Uh, so we think it's a reasonable approach. I want to thank those Democratic members and Republican members that have worked on this legislation. Certainly want to thank Senator Manchin of West Virginia and other Democrats in the U.S. Senate who are working with us on this legislation. And uh, I urge its passage. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Jim, I yield back. Joe would recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, future generations will be appalled that, that we're considering this bill. It denies the science of climate change and tries to stop EPA from protecting the American people from carbon pollution. It's a recipe for climate disaster. H.R. 3826 would amend the Clean Air Act to block any limits on carbon pollution from coal-fired power plants, which is the largest source of carbon pollution in the United States. When we should be moving forward to protect our children and grandchildren from the climate catastrophes, this bill will move us backwards. The dangers we are facing are real. They are large. And we may only have a short time to act before it becomes too late. Robert Rubin, a widely respected former Treasury Secretary, he comes from Wall Street, not the environmental movement. Yet this is what he said just last week about climate change. Quote, there are a lot of really significant monumental issues facing the global economy, but this supersedes all else, end quote. Scientists have produced study after study predicting devastating impacts on all facets of our economy and quality of life if we don't act now to cut carbon pollution. But instead, we're ignoring their warnings. At the hearing on this bill in November, I asked the Republicans, what's your plan for dealing with climate change? If you don't like EPA's approach, what's your alternative? There are many ways we could tackle climate change. We could put a price on carbon. We could support the development of clean energy. We could put limits on carbon pollution. But this bill is not an answer. It denies there's a problem, blocks EPA action, and weakens the Clean Air Act. EPA has proposed requiring new coal plants to use available control pollution. Uh, uh, but this bill will block EPA from finalizing and implementing this rule. The bill also would block EPA from even proposing a plan for cutting carbon pollution from existing coal plants. EPA has been engaging with stakeholders to develop a reasonable and cost-effective approach, but this bill would halt that process. My message to my Republican colleagues remains simple. If you don't like what EPA is doing, Tell us what your alternative plan is. If you have other ideas for achieving the reductions in carbon pollution that scientists say are necessary to prevent catastrophic climate change, change let's hear them. But if you don't, you should step aside and let the president lead. The committee is also considering the Better Buildings Act today. This legislation in no way offsets the damage that would be done by the Whitfield bill. And nevertheless, it includes consensus provisions to develop a voluntary program to promote energy efficiency in spaces leased by tenants in commercial buildings, and I would certainly support that legislation. But I think this other bill, H.R. 3826, is an embarrassment for this committee to be considering, and I propose, I suppose, will be voted out, uh, hopefully not to go anywhere, but uh, nevertheless, it's an expression of our heads in the sand as uh, climate change uh, rolls on and causes more and more destruction. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this markup today. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of H.R. 3826, the Electric Electricity Security and Affordability Act. As I've said before, President Obama's radical global warming agenda and his desire to implement sweeping environmental regulations will raise prices on American families. The Energy Information Administration backs me up by projecting that U.S. residents, uh, U.S. residential electricity rates will rise in 2014 and again in 2015. 
the federal government should not be trying to regulate certain modes of electricity generation out of existence. H.R. 3826 will ensure that we continue to have the energy diversity that protects us against higher costs. It's just common sense that we should use all the resources available here in the United States to become more energy secure. Ironically, while President Obama continues to blindly pursue this global warming agenda, I just got word from my wife a little while ago uh, that school for our kids will be canceled tomorrow and Wednesday because of snow in New Orleans, which we don't get uh, for very often. In fact, it's been years since the last time it snowed in New Orleans. And of course, uh, when we had the hearing last week, uh, I pointed out that two weeks ago it was so cold in Chicago that the polar bear was not allowed to go outside. Uh, so as the president continues to run jobs out of our country with his global warming agenda, uh, I do think it's, it's important to point out what's really happening in the real world, uh, but also not just uh, what's happening in terms of how cold it is, uh, but how devastating the president's impacts are on jobs in America. If we want to talk about damage this bill might do, uh, you know, it's not our job to be concerned about the Chinese jobs that will not be created because we'll be keeping them back here in America. The Energy and Power Subcommittee also received testimony from the coal, gas, nuclear, and renewable sectors. Everyone who testified agreed that diversity in power generation is essential to keeping prices low and ensuring electricity re reliability. In committee testimony, one white paper said, quote, the fact is diversity of fuel sources provides lower electricity rates, which promote national economic and job growth. U.S. regulatory policy is now pushing electric suppliers in one direction with the potential for significant economic harm, close quote. Our legislation would restore a much, much more prudent approach. I'm also glad the committee is considering H.R. 2126, the Better Buildings Act of 2013. This legislation will help building owners and tenants find ways to more efficiently construct facilities and save money. Again, I'd like to thank the chairman for this markup, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for an opening statement. We've got, we got, we got to help you out. When it gets cold and it snows, we go to school. <laughs> we'll give you some car hearts, get you ready. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a good day on the uh, uh, Better Buildings Act. You know, Dave McKinley uh, has got a lot of experience in this before he came to Congress, and he and I have been working together on this for a very long time. And David, thank you so much for an incredible job. And what's so tremendous about this is that uh, despite all of our differences, energy efficiency is a place where we can save money, uh, create jobs, uh, and um, it'll have a positive impact on the environment. And homes and buildings consume 40% of our energy in the U.S. And in commercial buildings, owners report that tenants consume up to 50% of the energy. So even with good landlords and owners, it's tough without tenant cooperation. So this legislation essentially gives some help to the tenants and encouragement on a private sector model, voluntary, uh, to reap the benefits of an efficiency program. Uh, and that's the Voluntary Tenant Star Program. And we combine Energy Star buildings with Tenant Star rentals, we can optimize energy efficiency sh and shorten payback periods. There's one incredible example that just shows how much this can do. Um, there's the three Logan Square building in Philadelphia. Reed Smith, a tenant in this spa space, partnered with NRDC. And the combination of a, a building an energy efficient office and an Energy Star building provided Reed Smith with a 34% better energy saving performance compared to basic code compliance. That was $1.8 million in electricity savings over the life of the lease and a 1.6 year payback period. So this really can work. Uh, and that private sector model, we hope uh, we can have real value for federal office space as well. So it's been tremendous working with, with David. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate your help because you've been encouraging us uh, from the very beginning along with Mr. Whitfield uh, and Mr. Rush and Mr. Waxman also have been uh, very much there. But you know, we've got some private sector folks who've been pushing on this. They're out in the real world. And uh, the real estate uh, roundtable, and particularly Dwayne De uh, Desiderio, has been helping on this uh, from day one. He's with the roundtable. And I want to thank some other stakeholders, including, uh, but this is by no means the complete list, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council, the Alliance to Save Energy, and NRDC for their support. 
And I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to working with you and my colleague, Mr. McKinley, uh, uh, for successful committee passage and hopefully floor passage and then Senate passage. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. I look forward to working with the gentleman. You've done great work, really have, and I'm pleased to see this bill move through the subcommittee. Chair would now recognize uh, Mr. Latta for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and today's mark is, markup is an important step towards ensuring hardworking American families continue to have access to reliable, low-cost energy. H.R. 3826, the Electricity, Security, and Affordability Act, is a bipartisan, bicameral response to the EPA's effort to eliminate coal-fired power from our nation's energy mix. As I've said many times before, we all want cleaner air and a healthy environment for generations to come. But costly, unachievable government mandates are not the answer. There is no doubt if the EPA moves forward with its uh, greenhouse gas regulations, energy prices will increase. The Ohio families I represent are already having to make difficult budgetary decisions among health care, food, and other necessities. Increased energy costs will only make the situation worse. Our most vulnerable citizens, including our senior citizens who are on fixed incomes, would be especially hard hit. I do not believe we should live in a world where American families have to choose between a hot dinner or a heated home. Our approach to a better energy future should, come, should be one of innovation and economic growth balanced with realistic agency standards. Our power suppliers are already finding ways to be cleaner and more efficient without sacrificing access to affordable energy. I support these efforts and Coe's important role, which is why I'm an original co-sponsor of H.R. 3826. I urge my colleagues' support, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's markup. We have two strong bills before us. The first of the bills is the Bipartisan Better Buildings Act from my colleagues, Mr. McKinley, West Virginia, and Mr. Welch, my parents' new home state of Vermont. That's my colleague from Vermont to talk to my parents about driving to school in the snow. They'll tell you that the last place you want to be in southeast Texas with snows is on the highway. It's a very, very dangerous place to be. Texans are among the biggest energy users in the country. That's not a surprise. Anyone who's been to Houston in July knows that a powerful air, con air conditioner is the key to happiness and economic growth. A gallon of Bluebell ice cream doesn't hurt either. My bosses in Texas 22 pay their bills and have the right to use energy as they see fit to live their lives. However, with so many federal buildings, the less energy the government uses, the more money we save the taxpayer. Improving federal efficiency helps in a small way to reduce wasteful spending. This bill creates a pathway to lower federal power usage. It also allows the federal government to set an example without mandates for the private sector to follow as they see fit. That makes a lot of sense to me. The other bill before us is Chairman Whitfield's Electricity Security and Affordability Act. I was a proud co-sponsor of this bill. As I discussed in our subcommittee markup, this bill is of critical importance. The Obama EPA has used even well-worn sections of the environmental law to write some of the strictest regulations this nation has ever seen. The Court of Appeals here in Washington has been busy sifting through 4.5 years of overreach. However, past rules are a preview to greenhouse gas regulations. As we heard in the subcommittee, EPA's new rule for coal power is impossible for plans to meet, even with one, federal funding, two, a way to sell captured carbon at a profit, and three, a complete CO2 pipeline, the carbon capture technology being required by EPA is unaffordable. Without today's legislation, EPA is essentially banning coal, one of the most reliable and cheapest sources of energy in our grid. The Whitfield Mansion Bill also prevents unreasonable carbon regulations on existing coal plants. With the Obama's EPA's track record, energy consumers in states like Texas literally 
cannot afford a rule that devastates our coal fleet. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to voting for both bills at tomorrow's markup. I yield back. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing these two bills before us today for the uh, uh, comments and tomorrow's votes. Um, last year, our office uh, hosted a roundtable discussion on climate change in the district. We had climate scientists, economists, and academicians from all sides of the issue. Well, we may have differed our opinions on what Congress should do. The one thing that stood out that we had common ground on, and that was on energy efficiency. Finding ways to use energy more efficiently, efficiently is common sense. We ought to be promoting efficiency as a way to save energy, money, and create jobs. H.R. 2126 will provide this country with a market-driven, voluntary, best practice approach to align business owners and their, and their tenants to reduce their demands on the energy grid. Peter Welch has been an excellent co-sponsor with us with me. I've enjoyed very much working with Peter. We've had a great relationship on dealing with this and other matters on energy efficiency. This is where it demonstrates where Republicans and Democrats can work together. As just one of two licensed engineers in Congress, with over 50 years in the construction e experience, I understand just what it takes to make our buildings more energy efficient. This legislation is supported by everyone from manufacturers, restaurateurs, the gaming industry, contractors, labor, and environmental advocates. It's estimated to lower the energy cost to consumers and businesses by $2 billion, $2 billion, and result in, in reduced carbon emissions by nearly 12 million tons. This moves our country also towards energy independence. Our priority in Congress should be to create an environment where business wants to create jobs, and passage of this bill ensures that we truly are working towards that goal. I'd like to thank again Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Waxman for allowing this bipartisan bill to come straight to markup. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Chairman yields back. Chair would recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilarakis, for an opening statement. I appreciate it very much. I, I commend Congressman Whitfield and Senator Manchin for working in a bipartisan manner and a bicameral nature to introduce H.R. 3826, the Electricity, Security, and Affordable Care Act. Uh, the, the administration's uh, vision through the pending greenhouse gas regulations for new and existing fossil fuel power plants threatened both our recovering economy and our energy independence. These regulations will mostly impact coal-fired electric generating plants. In order for these plants to comply with the law, they will have to capture and store underground about 40 percent of the carbon dioxide they emit. They emit. This technology has not been proven and does not exist on an industrial scale. Furthermore, it will halt new uh, coal plants from being constructed. A radical and harmful elimination of coal from our energy portfolio is short-sighted, and this important legislation will protect a significant source of American electricity. Nationally, in 2012, 37 percent of power was generated by coal, and with current production levels, we have enough estimated recoverable reserves to last more than 200 years. America's energy future is bright, and we still have a chance to choose a path that leads us there. Our vision, exemplifies by this legislation today, embraces the remarkable opportunities of affordable, reliable electricity. Our vision is focused on maximizing our country's abundant, affordable, and diverse energy resources, reducing emissions through technological development, economic competition, and market-based efficiencies, things that allow our economy and jobs to prosper are very different from the solutions offered <clears throat> by the current EPA. The administration's vision is to close the door on a vast and proven energy source, something that will hurt ratepayers, particularly seniors, the impoverished, and others on fixed incomes. This vision will also make doing business in America more difficult for manufacturers 
and others who require large amounts of electricity, like those in the information technology sector. The administration's rule will hurt job growth, period. There is nothing progressive about forcefully causing electricity prices to go up for those that cannot afford it. I urge my colleagues to support this very important legislation, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gen gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair reminds members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record by unanimous consent. And at this point, the chair would call up H.R. 2126 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 2126, to facilitate better alignment, cooperation, and best practices between commercial real estate landlords and tenants regarding energy efficiency in buildings and for other purposes. And without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point so ordered. For the information of members, we are now on H.R. 2126. The committee will reconvene tomorrow at 10 a.m., and I would remind members that the chair will give priority recognition to amendments offered on a bipartisan basis. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, and without objection, the committee stands in recess.